Uh, the issue on blood quantum has not come up a whole lot while I've been in term. Uh, I think it may be a few individuals that thinks it needs to be changed, but uh, I think there should be uh, uh, something like a forum or community discussions on this issue, and then if there's enough people that feel like it should, then uh, it should, uh, when they go through the process of uh, uh, getting it on a ballot, then uh, the people would uh, make their choice on this issue. The first question says, do you support removing the blood quantum requirement from Muskogee Creek Nation public office? I support dialogue uh, to discuss uh, this matter, and I think that possibly uh, there would be a lot more understanding and there would be a lot more clarification of the ramifications, if you will, of changing the uh, blood quantum requirement. I know that uh, you can't deny the fact that uh, an overwhelming majority of our citizens are now quarter blood or less, or less than quarter blood, and I think that's got to be considered. But in order to consider that, I think there needs to be uh, discussion, and formal discussion, uh, with everyone that has an interest in this matter. So as a representative, I think we represent the people, we represent the majority of the people, and if, you know, it's in our Constitution, it'll require a constitutional amendment, and I don't believe constitutional amendments should be taken lightly. Uh, they should be thought out well. They should be discussed and uh, before this is offered. Hi, I'm Anna Marshall, a.k.a. Ann, known by many as Ann. I just want to state that uh, as I answer the, the questions, and that's my task at hand for today, is that um, there will be five questions that I'm going to answer. And... I have, uh, based on my experience, I'm a market researcher at one time in my life, and I'm, a, I'm also a certified mediator. So I always look at all perspectives when, I, when I'm proposed a question or if an issue presents itself. I always look at all different perspectives, all the pros and the cons. And so is the first response that I have is, do I support removing the blood quantum requirement from Muskogee Creek Nation Public Office. I believe uh, after having conferred with several people across the board, uh, my sample wasn't thousands of people, but it was a, a large enough group of people who I respect. And uh, I would say that at this point, I think that we need to, I know it's an emotional issue. And sometimes, many times we need to step back and we need to look at all of it rather than just one side of it. And for me, I think that at some point, we have to look at the timing of these questions and the timing of the issues. And as we start talking about removing the blood quantum requirement to hold public office, which would be this position of, you know, a council representative, a chief, and a, and a, by, and a second chief. And as we look at those positions, I believe that at this moment in time, we need to have more conversation about it because eventually in the next 10 to 20 years, that will be the question at hand. And I believe that we need to have more discussion. We need to talk about it, look at the different perspectives and to, to meet a medium path and a medium ground where everyone comes out as winners rather than a win and lose situation, but that we look at how we move forward dealing with this blood quantum requirement. And this won't be the first time that we talk about this. There's gonna be a lot of conversations about it. And I'm sure not just this election, but probably subsequent elections where this question will be coming up. And at this point, I would say the blood quantum requirement uh, just needs to be looked at and talked about more. And as far as for me, I believe that the blood quantum uh, requirement should remain as is, the, the one quarter. Uh, transparency, that's been a subject for, for a long time now, and I think at this point we're very transparent on what we can share with uh, our citizens, 
And so I think uh, if anybody has any other ideas, you know, I'd be glad to listen, but I think we're pretty transparent at this point. Uh, first of all, uh, our investments, and I'm, I'm assuming it's talking about our investments, the tribal government fund investments. Uh, first of all, the investments as they are, are made in various areas depending on, uh, I guess it's uh, the administration. Uh, and of course the administration brings uh, the investment uh, firm to the council and the council either approves or denies uh, the investment of those funds. However, the reporting of those funds I think need to be a little more open, a little more um, formal, and, uh, and, and those funds need to be uh, taken a look at by our uh, top financial uh, folks and uh, to advise the council whether or not the, these funds are being uh, used wisely or if they're being invested wisely and uh, that should be done at least at least on a quarterly basis and uh, I know that there are reports that are being made that do that are made however I don't know just how well they're scrutinized uh, I know that there have been times in the past where uh, sometimes our investments uh, weren't scrutinized that well. And uh, however, I think over the long run, having been involved in the tribe for several years, I saw that we there's been some good investments that have been made. And I'm sure anything can be improved on. So I think that totally needs to be a, an open, uh, transparent uh, process not only to the legislative body, but to the citizens as well. And I know that over the past several uh, elections and over the past several years, there's always been questions about our investments. Where are they? How are they? How's the interest rate paying back? How much have we borrowed? How much have we invested? And there are a lot of financial uh, questions that have always been raised by our citizens. And for me, I think financial transparency, the responsibilities of the council, and particularly from my area, I would want to take the knowledge that I know about budgets, about finances, about investments, and to be able to go back and explain to my constituents or any constituents throughout the nation and making sure that we all understand where the investments are, how they're, how they're being managed, and what is our return on these investments. And sometimes uh, we're talking about financial investments. And so I would want to do that first is to, the way we improve it is to go back and explain these to our constituents. I, I've gone to some community meetings and I've been in different conversations around the nation and I don't know that I've even had financial transparency. And I don't even know that it's been explained to me in terms that I understand. Uh, we, I think we have a pretty good con communication with at large citizens. Uh, we uh, usually go out to the, uh, the citizens that live at large maybe once a year. And also I think the Muskogee media does a great job in uh, uh, communicating with our uh, citizens to let them know what is going on with the nation. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I think that at-large citizens, uh, you know, they constitute a great uh, number of our citizens, a great number of our voters. They are, they are a uh, very uh, large voting block. And uh, regardless whether they live within one, any of the districts here in the Creek Nation or not, they're just as much citizens as anybody else. And so I'm, I will be open totally. I will give all of my contact information. Uh, to anyone, including at-large citizens, and their their interests are, uh, I guess, somewhat unique. They're a little bit different than those that live within the Creek Nation because there's a lot of services that aren't available to them for the simple reason that a lot of the services that are available to Creeks within the boundaries are federal funds, and by federal restriction or by federal guidelines, uh, those resources are available only to those citizens. We need to come up with uh, maybe innovative ways to deal with that. Uh, and I think that once again, uh, as the answer to a lot of my questions is dialogue. 
a lot of it is getting together with the citizens, uh, with the leadership of the of the nation, uh, to see what those uh, types of services are, and and also to provide open communication with at-large citizens. As it is now, we have a uh, individual who is uh, uh, responsible for uh, communicating for the administration to at-large citizens, and and that's good. But I think that we can always improve any, you know, uh, that uh, process. Uh, yes, I used to be an at-large citizen myself when I lived in New York City. And I know that the only time I ever got any communication from, from the nation was in regard to elections. I would get huge amounts of campaign literature and not knowing some of the people, but there were a lot of people that I didn't know. And so I think that, that uh, considering the situations that we're in now, I'm the person that wants to have a more one-on-one -on -one conversation. I want to be able to hear what your issues are. What are the ideas that you have as at-large citizens? What is, your, what is your dreams and your hopes that this nation can do for you as an at-large citizen? And the way I would do that, my plan would be to make it my plan every quarter to come to your community and for you to tell me what your ideas are, what your hopes, what your dreams, your concerns, and the issues are, so that I hear them firsthand and I don't hear them secondhand and third and fourth hand, but I do hear it from you, the people who are being affected by some of the policies of the tribe and the way that business is conducted. Yes, I think, uh, you know, if the citizens uh, uh, want to do that, then, you know, if the majority uh, says that, you know, they want a constitutional amendment, then I think it should go before them for a vote. I support citizens being allowed to determine their own uh, future uh, or their own uh, circumstances. Uh, you know, as a legislative body, we're elected uh, to uh, make decisions uh, based on what we think are in the best needs of the nation. A part of that also is that uh, the legislative body's job is to uh, listen to the citizens. And if uh, there, once again, dialogue, once again, if we have hearings, if we have discussion, and it appears that the majority of the Creek Nation is interested in this, I don't think we should restrict uh, the uh, process of amending our Constitution uh, in order to allow certain things because, you know, even though we are a legislative body, we make those determinations. There's also a process for citizens to uh, be involved in the constitutional change process or the change of law. And I believe, uh, as many people believe, I have traveled to many places in the world and I know that there are areas of media where we don't get the true story of what really happens in places. I've been to the Middle East, I've been to Russia, and I've been to Turkey, and I know that things in Russia aren't always as bad as people think because there's a huge respect for native people in Russia. Not only that, but you go to Turkey, there's a huge admiration for the indigenous peoples of, of Turtle Island. And then when I go to the Middle East, I see the, the situations in Palestine and the sufferings that they go through, and we never see the people of those places. We always hear about the bad things that, that happen. And I think it's important for our citizens to be able to say that they want to have free press. And it's a free press that's unbiased. And I know that we always have biases put into articles how we're quoted and, and things of that nature. But I think it's really important for this, uh, for, to have a free press because we want to be able to know all sides of what's going on in the administration, what's going on in the council, to be able to have a good understanding and to be able to look at our, our nation and say, well, we need to improve in that area and this is what I read about this and this is how, this is my opinion of that. And then that way we learn to work together and to have a common goal that we want this nation to be the best. We want to be able to put our imprint on the world and let people know that we're here. Uh, my position on Friedman is uh, very simple. I think that if you're legally 
eligible for membership in our nation, then so be it. You know, it was determined in the 1979 constitutional referendum uh, that the uh, freedmen would be eliminated from the Muscogee Creek Nation. And uh, I think that any time that uh, there is a strong enough uh, push by the majority of the citizens to amend the Constitution, you know, I, I have no problem with it. anything that the majority of the Muscogee Creek Nation wants. And that, that includes the quarter blood issue. Uh, but we've got to be sure that they, this is something that the majority would want. Uh, personally, my position on the admission of freedmen descendants, I think that uh, I lived through the era of the 1979 Constitution. And I think that there was, once again, uh, a lot of factors that played into the approval of that Constitution. I believe that a lot of people were excited that the Creek Nation was reorganizing. We were ready to uh, get our own Constitution and, and uh, uh, to get our sovereignty back. And, and in doing that, I think there was uh, probably uh, a, a little bit of misinformation or lack of information about some of these things. I, I personally don't have a problem with the uh, Freedman issue as it stands today, as it was determined in 1979. However, I will say this, I do have a little bit of problem with the fact that many people were enrolled as freedmen who had Muscogee Creek blood and simply by the virtue of uh, their mothers being the Creek and not the fathers and the fathers being freedmen, they were put on freedmen rolls. Consequently, there were some freedmen who had more Creek blood than some of the non uh, or, or some of the regular citizens who had white blood, for example. I also know that there was uh, um, some people were mistakenly added to our roles in the original roles who were just uh, settlers in Oklahoma, weren't even Creek, they were in, but they somehow found a way to get enrolled and uh, I'm sure that there's descendants or remnants of those people around and there are still uh, people who are considered freedmen who are not allowed on the rolls who have Creek blood. So uh, I think that this matter uh, needs to be taken a look at uh, to see, uh, but as far as the actual pure freedmen, once again, it would take a constitutional amendment and not a legislative change by a uh, representative or a body of representatives. So I think that would require a, a full discussion and and if it appears that uh, the majority of the people uh, would want um, constitutional change, that would certainly have to be considered. And I believe that uh, the freedman has, has always been an issue, not just among our, our nation, but in, in, in the nations of, of other tribes in this, in this state. And I believe that this is, a, this is a situation that I think that people have taken it to court um, and at some point we have to have the, the sovereignty to be able to decide for ourselves. And when we talk about that, I think this, this particular uh, issue really needs to have a lot of conversation. And I don't think that there's any position um, that can be definitive at this point. I think all of us just need to sit down, have a conversation, just start sharing where we're at, what we feel, where, where we believe that this nation needs to be. And we're not going to decide it at this election. I think it's, it may be, in, may be the next 10, 20, maybe 30, 40 years. It may not even be in my lifetime. It may be not even in your lifetime. But I think the position on admitting the freedmen um, is, is going to be a conversation piece for the next 10 to 20 years.